This week in the field, three tips for your seascape photography. Hi everyone, I'm Scott Davenport. Welcome to In The Field. Thanks for joining me today. So I got three tips for you today on your seascape photography. This is uh, coming straight out of the Oregon Coastal Workshops that I just finished up hosting. And uh, I've got more workshops coming up in the spring. If you are interested, head over to my website. I've got all the details there. Got a workshop in San Diego here in town. I also got another workshop in the Big Sur area of California. So there's still space left as I record this. Check them out if you'd like to join me. So uh, I hosted these uh, workshops up in Oregon and we did a lot of different things, worked on a lot of different techniques for capturing good images uh, along the uh, the coastlines. And I want to share uh, three of the themes that kind of emerged out of it that uh, really will help you with your composition and capture of ocean, seascapes, water, all that kind of stuff. So let's get into it. Tip number one is for working with filters, and specifically when you're new to working with filters. We, you know, we're landscape photographers. We want to be out at golden hour, sunrise or sunset. The challenge with sunset and coastal photography is time is very finite. As the sun starts to get to the point of casting a nice golden light, you've got maybe 15 to 20 minutes and then the sun's gone and the filters become almost unnecessary. That's a very rushed and compressed time, especially if you are new to the whole focus, turn off autofocus, put on the filter, calculate the amount of exposure, dial in those settings, fire the trigger, all the while thinking about what's my composition, what's the water doing. You're starting to get the idea here. There's a lot of things going on and the, the filter work can feel a little stressful when time is short. So instead, try practicing at sunrise. You've got longer amount of time, meaning you know, as the sun starts to come up higher and higher and throwing more light on the scene, well, you can always add more ND filters if you've got them in your bag. It's um, it's just a little more relaxed, and uh, you can also see what's going on and uh, not have as many struggles with perhaps snapping focus on particular subjects as light's getting dim. So if you're practicing with filters, try practicing at sunrise first. Second tip is with wide angle photography. And this can be a problem for composition if you're not used to working with very wide angle lenses. I'm talking things like 24 millimeter and lower, you know, anywhere from 14 to 24. That's really wide. And the thing that happens is subjects that are in the midground and the background start to become very small very fast. You know, you're shooting at a, at a mountain or a big sea stack or a cliff along the coastline. As soon as you go wide angle, that gets very small in the, the middle and the background of your photo, and your photo can make not feel right to you, or at least the, you know, not give you the, the type of feeling you're looking for. So when you're working with your wide angle lens, it's not about fitting everything in the frame. It's about exaggerating a foreground subject. You've got to find a foreground subject and get nearly right on top of it. Often we're, you know, a foot to a foot and a half away, you know, roughly a half a meter for, uh, for the metric folks from your subject. You want to really exaggerate that and try to have something in the midground that will you know, kind of bridge the gap or carry you into the background. I got a couple of examples here I want to show you. Here's one. Uh, these are unprocessed photos, so don't take the uh, the color tone and everything at uh, face value, but just for composition. I am about a foot on top of this rock here. Second rock, a third rock. This is already uh, looking like it's very far away, but I could walk to that rock from where I'm standing in a matter of 15 seconds. It was maybe 10 to 12 steps away, not very far at all. But the fact that there's something in that midground really bridges the gap. You know, these houses and this, you know, this cliff face look like it's miles away. It's not as far. That's being exaggerated by the wide angle lens. Let me show you another one here. This time I'm up on top of this corner of this particular bench and using the, the fact that there's a small amount of midground before the little drop off and then the ocean to help kind of kind of hold the scene together. Again, you know, unprocessed photo, just talking about composition here. If the midground is has too much space in it, you're gonna have a very big object in the foreground and a whole bunch of tiny stuff in the background. So looking for something in the midground is really helpful. So to sum that tip up, Wide angle lenses, get very close to your foreground subject. Make sure you've got a foreground subject and have either a minimal midground or something else in the midground that's going to carry your composition into the background. You don't have this, this vast expanse of nothingness where you've got a very big object and a very small object. You want to try and ease your viewer into that scene. It will give you more perception of depth. 
Well, the third tip has to do with focusing and when to break the rules for, uh, for landscape focusing. And I'm using rules kind of in air quotes there. But the, the classic rule is focus about a third into your frame and you're going to get a very solid depth of field. And this is when we're shooting at something like F16. At the ocean, there's a couple of challenges with that. Number one, F16 may not get you the depth you think it's going to get just because there is atmospherics, right? There's a lot of sea spray being thrown up into the air. And so subjects that are in your midground or in your background, those can look soft just because there is, you know, water vapor and mist in the air. And that's okay. That's a natural look for at the ocean. The other thing is you may have a significant amount of water in front of your main subject. And I want to show you a couple of examples of that. Now here's one where I've got this wave sweep coming up onto the beach and you know this is my main subject these rocks these three here if I were to focus a third into the scene I'd be focusing on water here that I know is going to be soft it's moving I'm using a filter to slow it down a little bit so instead it makes more sense for me to focus here on this rock I want to make sure this rock is crisp and this is not on the, the first third of the photo. Another example, same situation, even more exaggerated. All of this area here is fine if it's soft. This water's all moving around. I want to make sure I'm focusing on this rock. And this is clearly in the midground and you know bordering on going to the background. But this is my main subject. I want to make sure that is in focus. So sometimes you're going to break the rule of focusing one third into the frame. It may be because you have water moving through the scene and it's all right for that to be soft. Maybe the sand has got a sheen and it's going to be reflective. And so reflections can be slightly soft and you know, exaggerate and amplify that reflective feel. So don't always be a slave to a single rule for focusing when you're shooting at the ocean. Well, that's a taste of a few of the things that I worked on with uh, my fellow photographers up in Oregon during workshops. Again, if you are interested in joining me on a workshop, head over to my website. All the details are there. I've got some space in the spring workshops, and it'd be great to meet and shoot and work with you. And that's going to do it for this week's In the Field. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you did, let me know somehow. Comments on the video below. Questions about photography? Leave them in the comments, or if you want to keep it private, you can reach out through my website. And until next time, my name is Scott Davenport. Happy shooting. <music>